waste equals food. If we just take an example of nature, it operates according to a system of nutrients and metabolism in which there is no such thing as waste. Remember our cherry tree? The tree doesn't only look beautiful, but it also provides food and oxygen to humans and animals and nutrients to organisms and microorganisms. This is an example of cradle to cradle, the system that has nourished a planet for millions of years. But as industrialization happened, humans took, altered and synthesized the earth's crust in a way that cannot be safely returned to soil. The material flows in the current situation can be divided into two categories, biological and technical. Biological materials are any material that come from nature and can go back to nature, whereas technical materials come from materials used in industrial process. But how did we come from cradle to cradle to cradle to grave? Let's look at the brief history. From cradle to cradle to cradle to grave, a brief history of nutrients flow. Long before the rise of agriculture, humans made their needs from local materials, which were then easily decomposed and be consumed by nature when their use was over. The biological waste could be left behind to replenish soil, which was replacing nutrients. However, the rise of industrialization led to the adoption of new agricultural tools and techniques for quicker food production. Population increased and many communities began to take more resources and nutrients than could be restored. As more people were packed in a tiny amount of land, sanitation became a huge problem. Now the societies had to take care of their waste and you know, the rest is the history. Slowly, the increase in population led to the incredible pressure on the environment and use up of materials and resources from the land, from near as well as far away. New infrastructures were built all over the cities to transfer nutrients from place to place. Before we knew, houses and roads started competing for space with agriculture. In the 19th and early 20th century, synthetic fertilizers were developed. Lands started producing more crops than they usually did, but with severe effect. With the availability of synthetic fertilizers, very few farmers returned to local biological waste as a primary source of nutrients any longer. In pre-industrial culture, people safely biodegraded their waste once they were used. Technical nutrients such as metals were the exception. These were seen as highly valuable and were melted down and reused. Then came the Great Depression, where people were careful about reusing jars, jugs, foils. And during World War II, people saved rubber bands, aluminum foil, steel and other materials to feed industrial needs. But as cheaper materials and new synthetic flooded the post-war market, it became less expensive for industries to make a new aluminum plastics or glass bottle or packets at a central plant and ship it out than to build up local infrastructures for collecting, transporting and cleaning. Monstrous Hybrids The major problem of cradle-to-grave design was not the mountains of waste rising in landfills but the nutrients, because they were not rescued after they were used up once. One example of monotrous hybrid is a conventional leather shoe. At one time, shoes were tanned with vegetable chemicals, which were relatively safe. The shoe could biodegrade after its useful life or be safely burned. But vegetable tanning required that trees be harvested for their tannins. As a result, shoes took a long time to make and they were expensive. In the past 40 years, vegetable tanning has been replaced with chromium tanning, which is faster and cheaper. But chromium is rare and valuable for industries, and in some forms it is carcinogenic. Today, shoes are often tanned in developing countries where few if any precautions were taken to protect people and ecosystem. Besides, manufacturing waste may be dumped into nearby bodies of water or incinerated, either of which distributes toxins. A confusion of flows. Before modern sewage system, people would bury them or dispose of them in bodies of water sometimes even contaminated the drinking sources. It wasn't until the late 19th century that people began to make the connection between sanitation and public health, which provided the urgent impulse for sorting out sewage system. The original idea was to take relatively active biological-based sewage, principally from humans, and render it harmless. 
the solids were removed as sludge and the remaining liquid could be released essentially as water. That was the original strategy. But people began to pour all kind of things down the drain, and the waste itself now carried antibiotics and even waste cleaners, chemicals and other substances that will join chemical and biological substances. If we are going to design systems of effluence that goes into the environment, then perhaps we ought to design so that it goes as a part of nutrients flow. For example, the mineral phosphate is used as a fertilizer for crops around the world. Typical fertilizer uses phosphate that is mined from the rock, but extracting it is extremely destructive to the environment. But phosphate also occurs naturally in sweet sludge and other organic waste. What if we could design a system that safely captures the phosphate already in circulation, rather than discarding it as a sludge? A world of two metabolisms. Our life's basic needs depend on two essential elements, mass, which is the earth, and energy, the sun. This means whatever in here in the closed system is all we have and whatever we make within this closed system does not go away. If our systems contaminate Earth's biological mass and continue to throw away technical materials, we will indeed live in a world of limits and the Earth will literally become a grave. As already mentioned, there are two discrete metabolism on the planet. The first is the biological metabolism and the second is the technical. With the right design, all the products and materials manufactured by industry will safely feed these two metabolisms, providing nourishment for something new. Products can be composed either of materials that biodegrade and become food for biological cycles, or of technical materials that stay in a closed-loop technical cycles in which they continually circulate as valuable nutrients for industry. In order for these two metabolisms to remain healthy, valuable and successful, great care must be taken to avoid contaminating one with the other. Things that go into the organic metabolism must not contain mutagens, carcinogens, persistent toxins or other substances that accumulate in natural systems. In the same way, biological nutrients are not designed to be fed into the technical metabolism. Now let's look at the biological and technical metabolism deep in detail. The biological metabolism. The idea is clear here. We have to design a fabric that would not harm people who breathe in. A biological nutrient is a material or product that is designed to be used and then literally consumed by microorganisms in the soil and by other animals. Most packaging, which makes up to 50% of the volume of the municipal solid waste stream, can be designed as biological nutrients. For example, if a juice doesn't even last a week, why do we need a juice container that lasts decades? Why should individuals and communities be burdened with downcycling or landfilling such materials? In fact, as a biological nutrient, it would feed the nature. Wouldn't it be so great that after customers finished using it, they would simply tear the fabric or materials off and throw it onto the soil without feeling bad? Throwing something away can be fun, let's admit it and giving a guilt-free gift to the natural world is an incomparable pleasure. The Technical Metabolism A technical nutrient is a material or product that is designed to go back into the industrial metabolism from which it came. Some of them are toxic, which are wasted, but others are valuable nutrients for industry that ends up in a landfill. Isolating them from biological nutrients allows them to be upcycled rather than recycled to retain their high quality in a closed-loop industrial cycle. For example, when a vehicle is discarded, its component steel is recycled as an amalgam of all its steel parts along with the various steel alloys of other products. The vehicle is crossed, pressed and processed so that high ductile steel from the body and stainless steels are melted together with various other scrap steels and materials, compromising their high quality and drastically restricting their further use. As a human, we love the idea of being powerful, owner and unique, which means buying things that are brand new with a virgin material is part of our nature. But our Dr. Green thinks, in order for our zero-waste scenario to be practical, we have to introduce a concept that goes hand-in-hand hand with the notion of technical nutrient, the concept of product of service. Instead of assuming that all products are to be bought and disposed of by consumers, 
product containing valuable technical nutrients, for example cars, televisions, computers, and refrigerators would be redistributed as services. In this scenario, Dr. Green wants to watch TV. He effectively buys the service of such a product for a defined user period, let's say 10,000 hours of TV viewing, rather than the product itself. Now everyone is happy, Dr. Green, manufacturer, service provider, and the environment, as they all handle the service they need for as long as they need them and could upgrade as often as desired. Under this scenario, people could indulge their hunger for new products as often as they wish without feeling guilty. Car manufacturers would want people to turn in their old cars in order to regain valuable industrial nutrients. In the normal scenario, a customer comes and buys a car. As he drives off in a new car, never to enter the dealership again, the manufacturer is waving industrial resources goodbye. Instead, the companies could develop lasting and valuable relationships that enhance customers' quality of life for many decades and that continually enrich the industry itself with industrial food. Industry does not need to design what it takes to be durable beyond a certain amount of time, any more than nature does. The advantages of this system, when fully implemented, are enormous. It would produce no useless and potentially harmful waste. It would save manufacturers billions of dollars in valuable materials over time. When worlds collide If a product must, for a time being, remain a monotrous hybrid, it may take extra ingenuity to design and market it to have positive consequences for both biological and technical metabolisms. Running shoes, for example, can be redesigned so that their soles are biological nutrients. Then when they break down their pounding feet, they will feed the organic metabolism instead of poisoning it. The shoes should also be designed for easy disassembly in order to be safely recirculated in both cycles. Having said that, some materials do not fit into either the biological or technical metabolism because they contain materials that are hazardous, for example, nuclear waste and until technological ways of detoxifying them have been developed, they also require creative measures. Upcycling to remove the antimony residues and to create a clean waste and nutrients would be preferable when they will eventually be disposed of to enter natural system and nutrients flow. The materials in certain monotrous hybrid could be similarly gathered and separated. For example, in the textile industry, cotton could be composted out of polyester cotton textile blends and the polyester then returned to technical cycles. Making this successful transition requires leadership in these areas without negligence. Thank you for listening. In the next chapter, we will be talking about respect, diversity.